All right, hello everyone. Welcome to today's session of the Papagayo Project. My name is uh, Richie Marufo. I am one of the advisors of this of this project. Uh, I help mainly Jorge Gomez, who's kind of like the head honcho here. He uh, he's going to be here a little bit later. He's got some, he has some work things he has to take care of, but he'll be back or he'll join as soon as he can. But I do want to welcome you today. We have a very special guest, uh, like we do every week, right? We always have presentations of, of scholars, writers, uh, community members, and of course, students who present on a variety of topics. So this week, I'm very happy to to introduce our guest because I'm holding his book here, a collection of poems, How to Lie to a Customs Agent. Uh, so Carlos Fidel Espinosa is a writer, musician, activist, homie out of La Frontera. Uh, you know, what can I say? Like his his work is is uniquely his. When you know him, you know. And so, reading reading your your work, reading your words, man, it's like your authentic voice. And there's something really special about that. Um, I'm so. As always, you can pick up a copy if you haven't at EspinosaWrites.com. It is in the chat, and we will add it. Uh, we will add the link throughout the the talk and discussion. But I do want to encourage you guys as you listen in, please, you know, as you come up with questions, keep them in the back of your mind so you can ask at the end because this is a very interesting collection. Of course, someone else, Carlos is going to talk about it and read it. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and welcome our our, our guest today, Mr. Carlos Fidel Espinosa. Go and take it away, man. All right, thank you all for having me. Uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate being here and um, getting the chance to read. You know, I've I've been so busy running back and forth between um, here and uh, I had a teaching appointment in Arizona, uh, and then I ended up just coming back here. And um, I haven't had a chance to set up too many readings, but luckily we have Papagayo. Uh, so how to lie to a customs agent. Um, these poems were mostly written in uh, 2017 and 2018 uh, when I was working at uh, Power at the Pass on uh, Don Shapiro's book with uh, Valentin and Richie. And um, you know, I never thought of myself much as a poet. I always thought of myself more as a fiction writer and, and writing short stories. And I felt somewhere like uh, these, these poems are kind of festering inside of me. Uh, a lot of this book has to do with my mother's passing, which uh, happens to be today. And it was just by coincidence that it all came together on today. So if I get a little emotional on some of these poems, uh, you know, it's because it's it's things that I truly experienced. Uh, but on the other side, also, uh, you know, I have a crazy imagination and a lot of this stuff I made up. Uh, hopefully, if we have some time at the end, I would like to read something new that I'm working on and we can go go with that also. Uh, so. Like I had mentioned, a lot of these poems have to do with my mother's passing and sort of the, the things that I was thinking about during those times. And uh, one of them which is the first poem in the book, is titled, It's Easy to Lose a Lover in the Desert. Sometimes the desert dries the things we love to fine dust for the wind to carry over the Franklin Mountains and into Juaritos. This happened to my wife once when the police found her missing lover dead in the green chile fields of Hatch, New Mexico. The heat from the green chile made the bullish maggots furious, and they lacerated her lover's face and feasted on his soft skin. My wife never cried for him, not even when she found his heart in a bowl of pico de gallo that we ate together. Now she won't stop dreaming that she is the desert rain. In the desert, it's not unusual that we dream we are the rain. But in her dreams, her body soaks up the green chile field until her lover's sun-bleached bones take root and bloom. I've lost lovers to the desert too, but my wife doesn't care. She never asks about them. On her anniversary, she sends me postcards from Hatch, New Mexico, platitudes mostly. Uh, so, like I had mentioned before, um, you know, my, my imagination goes wild sometimes, and I got to thinking about what a dead body would look like in a chile field. And there's therefore it spawned uh, this, this poem, that poem, right? 
Uh, so here's another poem. It's called uh, Bone Marrow Stew. And this poem uh, was inspired by my mother passing away. She passed away from cancer. And I don't know if you all have ever had uh, bone marrow, but it's some of the most delicious uh, eatings you can get. Um, and you can knock out the bone marrow and put it like on top of a steak and it melts over it. And it's like this buttery, fat deliciousness that, uh, that, goes, on, that goes on top of meat very well. And bone marrow stew uh, is some of the healthiest stew that you can get, right? Uh, so this, this poem is inspired by the making of that stew. I buy femur bones at 3.39 a pound. And for a few extra bucks, Francis the butcher will run those femur bones through a bandsaw, cutting and grinding the cow's leg into thick bone chunks that he piles into an orange plastic bag. In that orange bag, the bone chunks curve like the spine of a tiger. I'm not interested in the bone. It's the gooey marrow that I need. Bone marrow stew isn't hard to make. Just turn up the heat and roast them bones. Kind of like chemo, my mama would laugh. Bone marrow stew starts with oil-soaked bones laid out on a greased baking pan pushed into a 400-degree oven. It's the same temperature Sylvia Plath used to bake her skull in the oven. Those bones will roast till the marrow turns into hot and greasy magma. The stench of the roasting bones cling to the corners of the kitchen like a dirty ghost. And it reminds Mama and I that the gods are lurching, ready to feast on my Mama's brown body. The first time I made bone marrow stew, the stench drove the neighbors mad. But when they saw the living skeleton that chemo had cooked out of my Mama, well, they shut the fuck up. The shame in the neighbor's eyes glistens like the grease marrow of the roasted bones. Bone marrow stew was Anthony Bourdain's death row meal and my mama's last meal. And together we licked up those fat butter bones while sitting under the mesquite trees avoiding the desert sun. These would be her last desert sunsets. At night she'd glow from the chemo gnawing on her bones. A week before she died, she told me that the nurses at her chemotherapy sessions treated her like cattle, measuring her femur setting the ovens and all the while salivating over the prospect of bone marrow stew. Yeah, that was great. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. That was visceral. Um, yeah, and a, a lot of a lot of what I what I write, uh, you know, it, I feel like it has to be in the body. Like we need, uh, like as as writers, because we don't have the the luxury of you know image and sound in terms of like putting a video up or or having this read to to a reader, right? So I imagine myself like, who would read this book? Who would? And when they sit down and read this book, where can I take them? How can I get them there? And so one of the ways I do it is, is by bringing a lot of that into the body and experiencing it. And of course, um, I think one of the best ways is, is through food, right? So that's sort of a running theme through this collection of poetry is, is, uh, is food. Because, you know, when, when, once you smell tamales, you know it's like it's Christmas time, you know? Once, once you smell that, uh, that wood burning outside, you know, oh, it's going to get cold soon. So uh, I think that that's a great way to, to, you know, get these words into the reader's body, right? So I'm going to read this, this other, uh, it's, it's four poems kind of tied into one. It's called How to Leave a Child in Four Delicious Recipes. And really when I sent this, this one to get published, uh, you know, several people picked it up. And that's kind of what gave, gave this book legs was like, that there was more than one person interested in publishing this this uh, this poem that I wrote, and I realized like a lot of these poems, uh, you know, they had some legs, and so this is the one that inspired the book. How to leave a child in four delicious recipes. Number one, rosemary chicken. Remove and discard the giblets from the cavity of a raw chicken. Season with kosher salt, pepper, rosemary, and lemon juice. Bake for 45 minutes in a 425 degree oven. When your wife gets home from work, she'll ask what the special occasion is. 
She'll ask you why, after 10 years of marriage, you've never made dinner, not once. Why all of a sudden are you cooking? Tell her that you're stressed. Tell her that you need to spend some quality time together, alone. Lie to her. Alarms will go off. Don't worry. It's the oven letting you know that the chicken is done. Let it rest under a foil tent for 15 minutes. Let the blood settle. Carve the chicken by inserting your knife between the joints and the bone. If the joints are tough, give the knife handle a whack. Kitchen shears work best for removing the spine and cutting through the ribs. Number two, seared scallops and linguine. Meet your girlfriend in a parking lot and take her car back to her apartment. Add linguine noodles to a pot of boiling salted water. In a large saucepan, sear scallops in butter and season with cracked black pepper. Add garlic, white wine, cooked pasta, and olive oil to the saucepan. Serve with a rich Merlot. Your girlfriend will ask you to leave your wife. Tell your girlfriend that she needs to be strong, that you love her. Tell her that your daughters are almost old enough to understand divorce. Tell her you're miserable at home. Number three, French toast. Crack four eggs into a bowl, add vanilla extract and milk. Whisk till the eggs froth. Dip white bread into the egg mixture and place it on a hot grease skillet. Sprinkle with confectioner's sugar and watch your daughters dip the bread in syrup and dance in their chairs as they eat. Explain to them that you and their mom are going to separate. Remind them that it's not their fault and tell them that you love them. Tell them that you will see them all the time. Serve them cold milk. And number four, add one scoop of Similac to a microwave safe plastic bottle and fill with water, shake and microwave. Check the temperature of the formula by sprinkling it over your wrist. After your daughter finishes her bottle, lay her on the changing table and remove her soiled diapers. Wipe her bottom and sprinkle her with baby powder. Put her to sleep. When your new wife asks you what you're going to make for dinner, tell her you'll start by removing and discarding the giblets from the cavity of a raw chicken and season it with kosher salt, pepper, rosemary, and lemon juice. Tell her you'll bake it for 45 minutes in a 425 degree oven. That's how you leave a child in four delicious recipes. Uh, so a lot of, of what I, you know, what I think a lot of us go through is, is this divorce. I'm sure you all are, are aware of the statistic that 50% uh, of all marriages end in divorce. Um, and some of us become victims of divorce, right? Uh, we get caught in the middle and our parents kind of, you know, use us as this weapon to hurt each other. And I'm sure you've all, or not all of you, but I'm sure some of you have experienced this where like your, your dad's new girlfriend comes in and, and your mom's like, oh, you know, she's, she's a tramp, she's trash. Or your girlfriend, your, your mom's new husband comes in and your dad's like, oh, you know, that guy's trash. He's not your real father. Um, and that kind of stays with us. And I think that that informs our relationship. So 50% of, of, of marriages end in divorce and 75% of marriages where there's a child involved from a different uh, uh, matrimony end in divorce. So that's a lot of divorce going on. And I reflect on that because in, in my life, um, you know, between my mother and my father, they've, they've been divorced a total of seven times. So I've had, uh, you know, a lot of stepfathers and stepmothers and, uh, there, that creates an interesting dynamic. Um, and so this next poem, the boys club, uh, was kind of inspired by the idea of step parents and how we treat step parents, right? Because as, as children also, you know, like, a new person moves into your house and suddenly they're entitled to everything in that house. And it, it, it creates this sort of animosity that the child feels towards that new step parent, because now they're taking the tension and time away from, from your mother or your father. And uh, now you, you have to be disciplined by this sort of outside source that isn't really related to you. Um, and in some cases, you know, you don't, you don't want a step parent, but it, it's the way life goes. Right. So this, this poem is called The Boys Club. 
I laughed when my stepmom got popped in the eye with the pit of an aguacate. She bruised for weeks, her purple eye hiding behind heavy tinted glasses that she borrowed from my dad. What were her excuses at work? Did she tell them that she fell, that she ran into the corner of a sharp cabinet? Oh, silly me, I never pay attention. They must have known that my dad pitched for the El Paso High baseball team. That when he palmed that aguacate pit, it took him back to when he was 17, standing on the pitcher's mound, ready to hurl his heat. My stepmom's eye, his catcher's mitt, scouts in the bleacher, his uniform riding high into his crotch, and the meat of her eye forever scarred with a sliver of gray. I heard my uncle's joke about how my dad had made guacamole out of her face. They bought him a beer and cheered him. I wonder what her father thought when she saw the ghost of the bruise still lingering on her face, the bruise now faded and only detectable under direct kitchen light. Her mother stirring the potato salad, whipping it into a frenzy, turning it into mush. What happened to your eye, her mother asked. My dad and his brothers sitting in the other room, watching the La Olla beat on old Julio Cesar Chavez. Knock him out, knock him out. Her father looking over at his gun safe where his well-oiled Remingtons are begging to be picked up. Linda's mother is staring at the ridge of my Indio nose and black bean eyes. Her face in a rage as she notices how much I look like my dad. But I keep my head down like I did that night when that thick, heavy brown pit soared across the dining room, a rocket, a comet, a fastball, head for the pit of sweet Linda's eye. All right, so <laughs> I'm gonna try to find a happy poem, but I don't think they exist. Uh, here's one, this one I wrote for my little girls, uh, Ella and Penelope, and it's titled Mother Wolf. Howl at the night, my sweet daughters, for in West Texas, the nights last forever. Your mother has gifted you with eyes that can see through the night, with eyes that can see through men. Rejoice at the dawn you have ushered in, for this day shall be lived with your mother at your side, nurturing you with her breasts, swaddling you with her love until you drift off into the land of Chango dreams, off to the land where the desert wren sings. When you grow up, you will understand why your mother's fangs are so sharp. Uh, and like I said, that was, uh, you know, inspired for my daughters. Um, and even though a lot of these things that I, that I write in this, you know, like I pull them from a true place. Um, like I said, sometimes I, you know, I, I pull it from an idea, from something that's happening in life. And then I create this entire narrative behind it. Um, so, you know, like my father never pitched for the El Paso baseball team, El Paso high base. He never played baseball. But I thought that that would be such a beautiful metaphor of showing this pit flying across, you know. Uh, but then others, for like for my daughters, you know, I wonder what kind of life they're going to grow up in and what kind of world and how things are going to be seen. And I want them to remember that uh, that they're as strong as, as, as their mother, you know, um, who I consider uh, to be a very strong and wonderful person. Uh, so... This next one is called The Customs because I think it's time we poke fun at some custom agents. I don't know. The Customs. Every customs I, a, agent I know is a Mexican. My neighbor's little brother works as a custom agent, though he got fired for backing his government-issued Chevy into the assistant chief. Also, I think Freddie is a border agent, or he's studying to be one. He dresses up like Spider-Man on the weekend and rents himself out to kids' parties and church good messes. Sometimes he wears his Spider-Man tights under his customs uniform, and that helps with his anxiety. Javi's dad also works for the customs. He's great at camouflaging with the desert because the vato is built like a nopal. All right, and uh, I'm just going to read the one that's right next to it. It's about uh, trying to get sober while living in the desert. And this one is inspired by um, Raymond Carver, 
And uh, hopefully some of you all know Raymond Carver's writing, uh, who's a great uh, short storyteller and, and really one of the people who sort of pushes uh, postmodern minimalism into, into the forefront of literature. And he came down to El Paso uh, to work at UTEP, and he helped build the creative writing department at UTEP. Um, and he was down here trying to get sober, which I think is is hilarious because, uh, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, everybody was going to Juarez to get tore up. And uh, so this poem is sort of inspired by that. Sun Cured, Finding Sobriety in the Desert. We all get cleansed by this wicked sun that bleaches our bones into caliche dust, destroyer of worlds. How long till my fatty liver and pickled kidneys wilt under the heat and cure into the earth? We all dry. We are dust in the deep desert mountains where I've cured into a tasty beef jerky of a man. My skin cracks at sunset and the night pours into my wounds as the world hangs me out to dry. Please don't let the flies take me apart piece by salty piece. Uh, okay, so uh, you guys wanna open it up for discussions or do you, should I talk some more, read some more? How do you all feel? Yeah, it's a good, good point. Does anyone want uh, have any questions right now at, at this point that they would like to ask? Um, Go ahead and uh, leave leave that open for if anyone has anything they'd like to ask of what he's read so far. Yeah, and also uh, of anything, you know, regarding uh, like if you want to get your own work published, where's good places to look or, um, uh, you know, editing, stuff like that. You know, on this book in particular, Richie, Richie helped me out tremendously. He helped me edit it and, uh, you know, read over these poems and 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 came up with ideas that really help propel this book so anything like that that you guys might have questions about i'm also willing to to answer not a question just commenting that's that was great stuff man thanks for sharing it uh, uh you took me places i loved it oh excellent excellent man thank you i'm glad you can you can hear it you know for sure man Well, we have uh, some students here, and they, they might be shy about asking questions. So if, if, if that's the case, you can also type it in the chat, and I can read it out loud for you. Like just, um, But maybe something like uh, stu uh, questions students always ask. You know, you read a, you read a lot about family in here. Um, so how, how have they responded so far, like seeing them come up in, in some of these poems? And I know that it's, it's some of it's like kind of personal stuff, and... As a writer, that's always something that's that's going to happen. So I'm curious to see how how you've been negotiating that. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> you know, one one time when I was when I was uh, still in graduate school, working on my thesis and and my writing, um, my dad told me, "Go ahead and write it all, son." And like my dad was a big influence on in my literary career. I mean, he's the one that that uh, got me interested in reading to begin with. And I remember as a little kid, he read to me uh, Cat's Cradle, which it's not really a little kid's book, but uh, I loved it nonetheless, right? And, I love um, that book. Yeah, yeah, it's an awesome book. Uh, and then he also read Dune, which like I, I think tomorrow's the release of the new Dune movie. Uh, so Shh. that really, right? Yeah, so that really brought me into this literary world. Um, so one time he told me, write it all, son, write it all, you know, write write about everything. You don't have to worry about how we're going to feel about it. Uh, so <laughs> having said that, uh, when my first, when my book first came out, he bought like 20 copies of it that he ordered from the publisher, uh, Floricanto uh, Press. Um, and then he read the book and he still has those, like at first he was like, yeah, I'm going to get these 20 books. No. And he still has those books in the garage because I think uh, Maybe he feels like it's it's him that I'm writing about, uh, which it kind of is, but it's not. You know, it's like a fictionalized version of an amalgamation of all my fathers and stepfathers, and and even like later on, you know, as an adult, you you kind of get these sort of fathers that come in and and uh, you know, sort of Joseph Campbell talks about this of these dads that they're sort of like your sit-in dads, like it might be a coach or it might be like a sensei or it might be a professor. 
Uh, huh. So there are amalgamations of this. It's not just my dad. Uh, and for my other family members, I mean, you know, my mother's passed. So uh, she can't really say anything on it. My wife, uh, she was like, hey, you know, write whatever you want. Write whatever you have to write. Um, she does sometimes tell me like, don't you dare write about this experience that happens to us, you know, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, but for the most part, she's like, write about whatever you're going to write. And, uh, like my other family members, I, re I really don't care too much about what they think. Um, uh, you know, I, it's, it's my job. It's my job to write and I'm going to write job. about the things. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I'm going to write about Things that, uh, you know, one of the things that like Chuck Palahniuk, the author of Fight Club, talks about is um, exhausting your traumas, or exhausting your bad experiences. Um, so I'm, I take those ideas and I just try to write them until they no longer bother me, until they, they lose some of their power. Um, yeah, so that's how I handle with my family, like how they, uh, you know, how they, how they see my reading. Um, but on the other, you know, on this other note, like, I taught at EPCC for nine years and um, I would often have my students write about their, their family. Right. And one of the assignments that I had them write about was uh, I had them write about a family member's hands. And I used the idea of like, if you look at a construction worker's hands, their hands are, are, are just, that's all like one big callus. Right. Or if you grab your grandmother's hands, they're like this soft, uh, uh, beautiful. I, I likened it to a, a warm bolillo bread. You know, they're like a little bit crusty from from time and age, <laughs> but they're nice and warm. You know, so I, I one of my assignments that I would have my students do was write about a family member's hands. It could even be their own hands. Um, and I think that uh, you know, I, I definitely had some students that gave those poems to their family members, and uh, it created a lot of beautiful emotions. Yeah, definitely. So I think it's okay to write about, you know, family and stuff. But, uh, and if they don't like it, they can write a book too and talk whatever shit they want to talk about me. You know what I mean? It's all good. <laughs> and that's how, that's how literary, uh, literary works happen. <laughs> yeah, definitely. The responses. <laughs> cool, man. Um, you mentioned Palinuk right now. Um, and I, I know we've talked about some of his stuff, uh, like personally, like just kind of hanging out here and there. Um, do you have any other like works from writers that really influence the way you think about writing that you might recommend to people listening right now? Oh, definitely Natalie Diaz. Natalie Diaz is uh, when my brother was an Aztec. Oh, I love that that collection of of uh, of poetry. Um, I haven't had a chance to read her new book. She just came out with a, a new book, uh, Post Colonial Love Poems. But how to how to uh, how my bro uh, sorry when my brother was an Aztec, uh, her collection of, of poetry, man, there's there's a poem in there about raisins, and when she was a little girl, they would not her the speaker right, but when they were little, she was a little girl, they would go to the auditorium and get the government issued raisins, and she would hate her mom because her mom would make her eat these raisins and it would give her upset stomachs, and. At the end of that poem, uh, she realizes that she hates re raisins for another reason, and that was that her mom was hungry the entire time Dang. that she was complaining about raisins. So, man, that 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 collection of poetry really blew my mind, and and that's that's one of my favorite writers for sure. Yeah, definitely. And also Chuck Palahniuk, uh, he just came out with a a book on craft. Uh, of the craft of writing called Consider This, I believe is what, is what it's called. Um, and it's a beautiful book on writing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, those are great books. Awesome, man. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, I also just want to do, see, I had Jorge, he just, he just made it in. So um, right now we're just doing a little, like we open up for some brief Q&A, but I don't know if, uh, Carlos, if you wanted to go back to, to talking about um, you don't have, I mean, cause you've, you've read quite a bit, you know, you don't want to give away the whole book for free, right? <laughs> and uh, why not? <laughs> no, you but, know? uh, one of the things that I think that was, was great. And I think it's worth talking about if not now, maybe later, but I, I definitely wanted to ask you about the process of not just finishing the book, but then afterwards, what you do afterwards, like of having to promote and the kind of things that you came up with, um, we can leave that towards the end, but, um, you know, I know that there's a whole publication history too. 
for this like uh, history with this publication because I know you had like a uh, several people who wanted to publish the entire book, right? You mentioned. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I had a uh, Floricanto Press was the first to to make me an offer on publishing the book, and then um, I was talking to to uh, Greece, um, and uh, sorry, it's because I know her as La Rana. I was talking to La Rana, and she was like, "Yo, you should send your book to uh, Flower Song." And they do this. They did my book, and it's a it's a it's a more beautiful place, you know. It's just, and I sent it to Flower Song, and he picked it up right away. Also, so now I had these two publishers, and I had to realize, uh, you know, which which one do I, which one do I pick? And this was like right before COVID hit. So Flower Song was going to publish it in 2022, and uh, Floricanto, the guy was like, um, I'll publish it as soon as I possibly can. And even though I think Flower Song is a is a beautiful publishing company, and I think that they make some of the most beautiful books, uh, I went with Floricanto Press, and um, part of me kind of regrets regrets it, only because uh, the person in, in charge of that isn't as hands on. Uh, they kind of like they publish the book, and then they have you do all the promotions and do all of that. Where I know. Um, Eduardo over at Flower Song, you know, he puts together events for his for his writers, and he he really does a, a lot of a lot of good work. Uh, plus, I would have had, you know, I could have been on uh, the same publishing company as Juan Felipe Herrera, who is an, also an amazing writer. Uh, but it's it's all right. It's the first book, and I told myself I'm just going to let this first book go and just learn from it. Um, and you know, I have a couple of other books in the. Uh, in the pipeline, um, my novel *Smothered* is almost almost ready to be sent out, and then I have a collection of short stories called uh, *Penelope*, *I Love You*, and other stories for the weird that uh, I'm finishing up. Also, so yeah, I hope that they that they find uh, good publishing companies to work with. You know, but it's interesting because there's this like crazy dynamic in, in publishing of where. Uh, you know, everything's very old school, very strict. Oh, if you publish here, you can't publish over there. And my thoughts always like, like, shit, the more people that can put my story out, the better, you know, but it's like, no, this, uh, once you get published here, this is the, you only have to be here. And this is the only prestige you can have. Um, and to me, I think that that kind of limits the, uh, the writer, you know, and I've, I've talked to a couple of other people about possibly putting together a publishing company that that would give the writer more more uh, opportunity and more income from their writing you know most books you get 10 12 percent of the sales and uh you know i don't feel right about that but we'll see those that's for a future endeavor yeah man of course and i know i know you um you also opened it up to the possibility of talking about like getting started in publishing um as a, as advice for for young writers, people wanting to, to get in there, uh, learn to accept rejection. And I know that that's something that a lot of writers say, but it's the truth. You're gonna send stuff out, and people are going to reject it a lot, a lot, a lot. So much so that it's gonna crush your soul at some point, and you're gonna say, "I'm done with this. I'm gonna go back to my job or whatever. I'm gonna do something else." Um, but if you're a real writer, if, if it's really in your heart, if it, if it really has a fire in you, you're just going to keep writing and keep writing. And, and you might take time off from sending stuff out so that you can keep working on your craft and then start sending it out again. But eventually you'll find your stride and you'll find your readers. You know, I had this student one time at EPCC. She was a good writer. Um, and she told me, I have 150,000 readers. And I was like, wow, how, how did you do that? You know, and, and she's like, well, I write fan fiction. And uh, she lists like four or five things, you know, like fan fiction for Star Wars and fan fiction for, uh, uh, I forgot what the other ones were, but I thought, geez, wow, like 150,000 readers. Like you take that to any publishing company and you show them that you have that many readers, they're going to pick up whatever book you put out, you know? Um, so Keep writing, keep writing, no matter what. 
make it so that it, you know, it, it burns deep inside of you that you have to write. Um, I know that if I don't write for like, let's say I'll take like a four, four weeks off of writing or something, I'll start to get depressed and then I need to go back to writing. Um, and I would also suggest write by hand, you know, get a pen and paper and write like that and then transfer it over to, to what you're typing. Um, because a lot of the times, you know, when you type something and it, it looks so nice and word and it looks nice and finished and everything's good. And you can't really like like mess around with it. But if you use a notebook and you you write something, you can put arrows to something else and you can sort of go into that narrative and figure out what you like before you kind of put it really nice up on a, on a word processor. So yeah, keep writing, keep on, keep on trucking, you know. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, for sure. Definitely, definitely. So uh, any other questions, ideas, thoughts? That's what I would always say in class. Any other questions, ideas, thoughts um, about uh, on writing? You know, I have this uh, short story that I've been working on. And uh, if I, maybe I can read it to you all and you all can tell me what you think. Um, Okay, the working title of the short story is called uh, What Slips in the Night. The moment I opened the gate, my slippery little schnauzer Bruno bolted out into the streets and there I go chasing after him. My wife loved Bruno so much, she even asked to sneak him into the hospital so she could see him one last time. I hid him in this backpack and gave him a sedative to keep him calm as I signed in at the nursing station. My wife's eyes lit up bright and beautiful when I pulled Bruno from the bag. He was still a puppy then. He moved his head back and forth, dazed as if waking from a nap. She held him in her arms, getting her IV tangled in his collar. I stood by the door to keep an eye out for the nurses. Bruno licked her cheeks and his puppy breath wafted in her face. She loved him so. He had these big, droopy brown eyes and a little silver beard. But now Bruno has bolted into the night and the other dogs in the neighborhood are going wild with jealousy. From behind their gates and doors, they are barking as Bruno lifts his hind leg and sprays piss all over their front yards. I promised my wife that I would take care of him. I hate animals especially dogs. Maybe they always sense my hatred for them, ever since a poodle bit my ankle. Every dog, including Bruno, would bark and growl at me. Bruno and I eventually got used to each other's company. Maybe he realized Elise wasn't coming home. He needed me to feed him and walk him. He needed me to let him out to take a crap in the front yard. And maybe I needed him too. So that night after he ran out of the front gate, I had to get back, I had to get him back. And I rushed into the house to find his dog treats in his collar. Sometimes I could get him back with a treat. And other times I had to chase him down. But eventually he got too fast for me. And I found this other method. I would chase after him and then I would give up and turn back after 10 minutes of chasing him. He'd run up alongside me and walk to the house and if I tried to grab him, swoosh, he'd bolt again, darting across the street. I learned the best thing to do was to walk back home. And he'd follow me past the front gate and into our house. Sometimes my children would help chase him. He always ran back to them. But tonight the kiddos were at grandma's house. And though I had lost a lease, I was grateful that her mother had stepped up and helped with my girls. Elise looked like her mother, the same wavy brown hair, the same small, soft frame. It felt good to have somebody else in the house from time to time, somebody to help out. And I know my girls really appreciated having grandma around. They needed somebody to teach them about being a woman. By the time I get outside, all the neighborhood dogs are howling, and I can tell which direction Bruno is headed by the howls and barks down the street. And I run down the street yelling, Bruno, Bruno, come over here, Papa. The dogs are going mad. 
I run past an elderly couple walking their dog, an overweight chihuahua huffing and pus puffing as it patters down the street. The chihuahua growled at me for half a second before running out of breath. The elderly couple pointed in the direction down the street. He went that way, the elderly woman said. And I sped past them and nodded my head in gratitude. I saw Bruno dart across the street and I too darted across the street and I had him cornered in this yard and he looked at me with his big brown eyes and he reached, I reached down, waving the dried meat jerky in front of him. He walked to me slow and cautious. If I made any sudden moves and he would dart out of my grasp and I'd be chasing him for another 10 minutes before giving up and returning to my house. I dropped down to one knee, begging him to take the treat and he walked towards me. And then the old couple with the fat chihuahua came up from behind. Can we help? Their fat little dog still wheezing and Bruno went mad and darted across the street. The gordo chihuahua tried barking but lost its breath and went back to wheezing. He's a runner, the old lady said. And I waited a few moments making sure the car wasn't driving down the street. What's his name, the old man asked, Bruno. Then this gray Dodge Charger turns the corner and the car barrels down the street and the old couple started calling out Bruno's name. Maybe they didn't see the car or maybe they figured the car would stop. Either way, Bruno never came when, the one, when his name was called. Then the old woman called out Bruno's name. Something in her voice sounded sweet and familiar, like smelling honeysuckle at the beginning of spring. Her voice took me off guard. It took me back to the hospital room when I had snuck Bruno into the, to see my wife. Bruno, my wife said with the little energy she had left, that's how this old woman sounded. And Bruno's ears perked up and he looked up at us. The car was getting closer. Bruno, she said again, Bruno. And Bruno stepped to the curb and I too stepped to the curb. And I figured the driver would see me and slow down. And if not, maybe he'd stop. Bruno, she said. And on that, Bruno sprinted across the street. And the driver looked up for a second and saw me standing halfway in the street and he slammed his brakes. And I saw Bruno go under the car tires and I ran to the car. Bruno's top half stuck out from under the front tire. The driver, a teenage kid, got out of his car. Is he all right, mister? And I put my hand on Bruno's face and he looked at me with those big, beautiful brown eyes and licked my hand. I closed my eyes and prayed, please, Please let him be okay. When I pulled Bruno from under the tire, he yelped. And then I pulled him out. But only his top half came out from under the car. All right. So uh, that's the story I'm working on. What do y'all oh, think? Man, that's visceral. That, that, yeah, I felt that one. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you for sharing that with us, Carlos, giving us a little sneak peek. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, that's, you know, uh, these collection of short stories that I'm working on that's, that's coming up next. And that's one of them. Yeah. Yeah. What do you and, say the collection is called? Uh, Penelope. Oh, um, it's called uh, I Love You, Penelope, and Other Stories of the Strange. Mm. Yeah, I, I did notice some parallels with your connection here uh, of poems, you know, that I have. And uh, I just finished it last week. Um, you know, first, I, I wanted to apologize for, for being late. They, they scheduled me for a meeting that was right at this time. And they didn't even ask, like, if I could make it. They just wanted me there. Um, but I'm glad I could make it at least, you know, halfway through. Um, you know, I don't know if you've had a chance to already talk to some of my students here. Uh, if they've asked you anything, you know, I do have students here today who how are reading poetry right now. Um, so, you know, they're welcome to ask you uh, anything related to, to just the art of poetry. And it's great that you're sharing also a little bit under the hood, right, of like the publishing process and how that can be so difficult. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I wanted to open the floor again, if there were any questions from some of my students here on, um, on, on poetry, writing poetry, you know, some of the students out here today actually wrote poetry for the Latinx reading that we had uh, the past couple of weeks. So, you know, they themselves are getting into the art firsthand. Um, 
did anyone here have uh, other questions for Carlos about some of his, the specific content of his poems or just about writing poetry itself? I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, Carlos, are there any exercises that you do just to prepare your, prepare when you're going to write poetry, just little daily things that you do just to strengthen whatever writing skills you're trying to apply to your poetry? Uh, yeah, de uh, definitely. So, um, uh, you know, there's, there's different ways, I guess, uh, things to look at it sort of like almost like writer's block, right? Like it's hard to just sit down with a blank screen or a blank page and be like, okay, write something. Um, so one of the things that I do uh, is I always, and I always recommend this to, to fellow writers, is to try to imagine two people who are at like, let's say for example, a birthday party or at a wedding. And those two people are angry at each other and they wanna fight with each other, but they can't because they're in this social situation. So I always like, whenever I feel like I get stuck, I try to imagine whatever these two people are, they can be old, young, you know, teenagers, but they're ha they want to fight with each other. Maybe they're married. Maybe they're uh, maybe they're brother and sister, and they want to fight, but they can't fight in this social situation. And I start writing about that, and that usually sparks my imagination, right? Because there's a certain language that people have. Uh, there's a certain tone that people use with each other, but then there's a certain tone that is acceptable in public. And when those two things sort of come together and collide. Uh, you know, how, how do people change? How do their attitudes change with each other? Like if you're mad at somebody, but you're at a, at a kid's birthday party, you can't just go and scream at each other. Right. So how do they change? Like maybe there's like little slight sleight of hand, little things that happen, little gestures, like maybe they cut the birthday cake and um, you don't serve your girlfriend, her birthday cake. You just eat yours really fast, you know, or like little things like that, that would kind of, uh, create this tension. So anytime I feel stuck, I, I think about that, that sort of uh, dichotomy, and then I, I start writing about that. Um, and really anything else that that kind of is a, is a, a situation where there's a lot of tension, but you can't really express your emotions because you're in this social situation. And that usually helps get, get the, uh, you know, the ideas rolling. Definitely great question. Yeah, absolutely, man. <laughs> that was cool. Thank you, Eddie. Yeah, great question, Eddie. Uh, and, and thank you, you know, for, for telling your students too, by the way, Eddie. Uh, it's great to see you back here. Right? Yeah. Um, any other questions? We do have some a few more minutes left. Um, so like any other, uh, if I know that uh, George, you had mentioned that some of your students were working on poetry. Um, you know, if, if they'd like, they can submit it to Barrio Panther. Um, we're doing volume four. Uh, hopefully it'll be out by uh, the end of spring. So if they want to send some work, you know, I'll have some of my editors look at it and, um, you know, hopefully we can, we can accept some of their work and, and I'm always eager to to work with new writers. And uh, so please, if, if you're out there and you write poetry, you write short stories, or even if you're writing creative nonfiction essays, uh, send them my way in it. And uh, our editors will look at them and, and hopefully they'll get into the book. Awesome. Would you mind dropping the, uh, the link to that in the chat for us? Sure. Um, you know, so this is the first time that we've had you uh, at Babagayo, uh, but it's great that, you know, you were able to read from your collection. I do hope that those of you who read it today, you know, you'll see a lot of parallels with um, those of you who are in my 1302. So we read La Migra by Pat Mora, and then we read, um, I don't know if you guys have checked out uh, Alice, uh, who's, you know, a UTEP professor and friend, um, 23 Reasons Why which is based off Juan Pali Pereira's, you know, which I also saw you, you had a nod to, right? So she's got that one for the Walmart massacre that they read uh, last week. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, Juan Pali Pereira's, I mean, he's an amazing dude. And I had a chance to hang out with him uh, when I did a reading over at uh, Fresno State. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, he's an amazing guy. And his writing is, I mean, it, 
yeah, I think I had a uh, 39 reasons why Chicanos should go to, to college. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, something that's interesting is, uh, the, you know, the last time I joined you guys, uh, was for, uh, Jose Oliveira's reading. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I had never read his book, right. I, I had never read it until after that, that reading. Uh, and then I noticed that he also has a, a poem titled like when your mom turns 50, something along those lines. And I thought, you know, that's interesting because I have a poem titled when your mom dies at 51 mm. and, uh, <laughs> you know, and like serendipitously, you know, he has this book citizens illegal and, and, uh, and I have this book, how to lie to a customs agent. Mm-hmm. So it was pretty cool. Like, you know, seeing that these ideas are like, uh, you know, they're growing, right? These ideas of, of what it means to to have to deal with borders and have to deal with these societies and these two sort of, you kind of juggling this juggling act. Or some of us just drop the balls and just say, you know, let's make our own way of thinking about things, uh, which which I, I, I love. I love it in the, in the writing, definitely. Yeah, there was definitely a mind meld that was going on there. And uh, yeah, I, I definitely saw a lot of Olivares in your connection here. Uh, I don't know which ones you read. Uh, so again, my apologies, but I think my favorite was probably your titular poem, you know, How I to a Customs Agent, in part because it reminded me of, uh, as I'm sure for many of the students here, you know, you describe a lot about the, your rich description and imagery about border crossing and when that one, it reminded me of what happened with my uncle who was, you know, when he was trying to cross one time before I was born, um, he had hid uh, avocados under his hood because he was going to sell them. Um, you know, especially because, of course, avocados here are, you know, that they're, they're imported and et cetera. Uh, but anyway, so they discovered that. And he ended up, you know, losing his visa. And um, so that's one of the ones that really, really hit me. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think back to how feisty my grandmother was, you know, and her saying, like, I'm not going to show him my papers. What the hell is this, you know? What, what am I going to be showing him my papers? Um, so I don't know. You want me to read it? Is it cool? Do we have time for I can read it? Yeah, yeah, we, we can close with that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, So this is how to lie to a customs agent. With a new set of gleaming white dentures, my grandma ripped through the American flag, neatly sewn on the shit green uniform of the customs agent. You see, she ate her naturalization papers one hungry night when she heard my father was marrying a whitest woman. My grandmother swore never again to claim citizenship. That day on the bridge, I watched in horror as she tore through the concrete barriers of this cheap Texas border when the custom agents told her she couldn't cross seeds. They corrupt the integrity of the soil. But a corn is a corn is a corn. And she fought that customs agent, wrestling him until the entire Santa Fe International shook from the thunder in her heart. She knew the old Rurumari 1-2, the Jack Johnson slip, and her bones were clean from all the limpias she had as a child. American city, she roared. Mexicana, pocha, India, rurumari. That's my citizenship, Ike. She rolled the R's on her tongue until they became an assault on Anglo-American accents. My grandfather's ghost smiled down from the sky, his gold tooth, the gleaming sun. Eso, vieja, eso. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, how feisty she was. Mm-hmm. Though she, you know, she never really said don't marry a woman from Juarez. Actually, she advised all of us to marry women from Juarez, but I thought for the poem it would kind of, you know, be interesting, an interesting sort of uh tension there. Right. But yeah. Yeah, a corn is a corn is a corn. Yeah, I love that line too, Eddie. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, I, I want to thank you again, uh, Carlos. I hope things are going for you well at, at Chico. You know, congrats again on that. Uh, I'm very happy for you. Oh, at Cochis? Yeah. Yeah, I already quit that job. Oh. <laughs> Man. Yeah, I'm back in El Paso. 
Okay. So, uh, but yeah, yeah, that, I, I had it out with the dean, uh, and he told me to go back where I came from, so I did. Oh, damn. Yeah, so I did. But um, it, was, it was a good experience while it was there, you know? Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, we're always happy to have you back here at, at uh, EPCC, of course. Um, and um, yeah, you know, you, your work is, is so important to the border. And, uh, you know, um, I, I want to thank you again for offering us a reading of it. Uh, I think Richie is recording this. So if, if you want, we could also make this available for those who were not able to make it. Um, so I want to thank everyone here for making it to, you know, Eddie, all my students, Raina and Richie. Uh, Richie, thanks for covering for me at the beginning. Uh, did anyone have any uh, final things you want to mention? I just want to thank you guys for always uh, having these events. They really, they really helped save us last year when we were doing our classes virtually. Um, you know, I was fortunate that uh, uh, quite a few of my students would join in on Wednesdays and Carlos, thank you for sharing your, your words. Beautiful, powerful. The imagery is so vivid. I uh, got a little hungry when I, when I kept hearing the, uh, the, the mention of the foods and the description, but thank you guys for, for, for doing this for us. Yeah, man. Thank you. Thank you for always supporting, man. That's, that's awesome. Definitely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, of course, Papagayo, which I think is, is, is a beautiful, awesome. yes. amazing institution. And, uh, uh, you know, what it does for, for the community, the literary community and, and for writers, it's, it's amazing. And uh, yeah, thank you guys for, uh, for having me. You know, I, uh, I always love the opportunity to read and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome. It's awesome being here. And I miss talking to students and talking to, you know, people in, in that sense. And it's great to be here for that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, for sure. Go ahead. Jorge and uh, Richie, I just want to see if you remember Mia. She read last time. Um, man, I was so happy that you guys called her out that she volunteered to read, uh, God, I can't remember. I think it was your workshop, Richie. Yeah, yeah, it was, I remember. Yeah, she's yeah. been here, so <laughs> trying to get her to keep writing. And uh, thank you again, guys, for always, you know, doing this, so. <laughs> All right, Mia. Yeah. <laughs> like I had, had to pull her on into the frame, <laughs> like, no, don't, don't make me. <laughs> yeah, I was like, come on, you gotta pop in here, so. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you. And I uh, hope my students consider submitting to BarrioPanther.com. Tell your students too, Eddie. You know, it's a great little magazine. Uh, oh, I, I love it. I've got my, my three uh, editions right here on the desk. I love them. I love them. In fact, I need to get some more, Carlos, for my daughter. So I can just get you at uh, Espinosa Rights? Yeah. Can, at or should I go to BarrioPanther.com? Uh, EspinosaWrites.com. Perfect. I appreciate yeah. it, guys. Yeah, Gentlemen, thank you, man. You guys have a great day. It was it was a pleasure. Thank you, guys. Yeah. See you. Too. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Carlos. All right. Thank you, guys, man. I really appreciate this, and uh, you know, I, I like I said, I hope to see your all's work uh, in the near future. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Right on, man. Thank you so much, Carlos. All right. Y'all have a good one. Yeah. Peace. Take it easy.